Hallelujah. We've been talking about what if. I'm not going to rehearse everything that we've said in the past, but our keynote verse that we have been using is that out of Galatians 5, 22 and 23, where Paul tells us what the fruit or the harvest of walking in the Spirit is. The whole terminology of what if is, what if we walk in the Spirit? What if we walk in the Spirit? What's that look like? What happens in our lives? What does it produce if we are walking in the Spirit? And then the question in the contrast is, what if we don't? What if we don't walk in the Spirit? Then we get all this other stuff and basically the opposite of what Paul tells us on the positive side of our what if, what if we are filled with and walking in the Spirit of God. And so I believe it's a ready word, it's ripe, it's in season, and we've been basically talking about the fruit or the harvest of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And he says, against such there is no law. In other words, you're not bound by the law if you're walking in this, right? You're not bound by that. If you're walking in this, there's no law against this. This is wonderful. God says you're going to be above the law. You're going to be beyond the Old Testament and the way it was uh, then because we're not a a law of do's and don'ts. We're a law of life and, and the spirit of life and freedom that flows in the Spirit of God. And when the Spirit of God is in us and we're walking in the Spirit, it produces these kind of results in our lives. And so we've been talking about it and we got down to faithfulness. And uh, last Sunday, the Holy Spirit kind of decided to do His own thing. Hallelujah. And uh, I'm, I'm great with that. I mean, anytime. If He wants to do that, it's His service you're his people. He can do what he wants to do. And wasn't it wonderful? And, and uh, what God did in this house last Sunday. But, but I want you to know that in this, I'm not going to go back and rehearse faithfulness in that. I'm going to move forward today. And I felt very strongly to speak to you guys almost prophetically and strategically regarding faithfulness today it's a prophetic word and it's a strategic word that i want to come to you with today the book of acts is really a we we call it the acts of the apostles and the early church and it shows and in many most theologians call the book of acts a historical book that we are reflecting back on the history of the church. But I see the book of Acts very differently. I see the book of Acts as the fulfillment of the great commission that Jesus gave in his departure. I see it as a strategic book. Because you see, we can't go until we're empowered. And in Acts chapter 2, the church was born and empowered by Holy Spirit. We're talking about what if I walk in the Spirit. And we see throughout the book of Acts this strategic layout of God that is laid out right in front of us. It's almost as if we are in on heaven's war room where they are putting up on the board strategy. Because the commission or the command or the mission was to go and win the lost and make disciples. And he said, go to the uttermost parts of the earth. Go everywhere. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and now everywhere. And Acts shows us how they implemented that strategy and that mission that, that Jesus had commanded the, the body of Christ to. 
And so I think that as we read the book of Acts, sometimes we need to look at it through a different lens. It's much, much more, you guys, than a book of history. It is a book that shows us how God did what the mission was and how it was implemented. It is a book of strategy. It is a book of vision. It is a book of spiritual warfare. Because everywhere they went, they came up against territorial spirits and demonic strongholds that were over entire regions that were combating the gospel and trying to hinder it and stop it from the mission. How many of you know when you're in warfare, there is an enemy trying to stop you? Jesus said, I want you to go and occupy the land until I come. And, and there are spiritual strongholds. There is an enemy trying to keep people bound. Jesus said this. He said, how are you going to get people free unless you understand that there's a strong man that's got them bound and you first got to bind the strong man to loose his goods. There's strategy. And Jesus talked about this before we ever went into the book of Acts and the implementation of the strategy. When we come together in prayer on Tuesday night, we are establishing, we call it prayer command center because it's strategic prayer for what God has called us to do as a people. You're not coming for this little, now I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. God bless mommy and daddy. And I know we're teaching our children to pray, but I got to tell you, this isn't that. This isn't a prayer meeting where we come together and, and, and people go around and say, I have this need and I have that need and then I want to give praise about this and praise about that. And you spend 45 minutes hearing everybody's need and my big toe hurts and pray for that and on and on and on like many many prayer meetings and then you pray for five minutes and go home no baby we're doing warfare we're doing warfare when we come together in prayer you're going to get in on the command center the the center of what god is doing in this region and what god is doing in our lives and in people's lives we pray strategically when we come together because God is a God of strategy and the book of Acts lays that out for us and whenever we get down to the Apostle Paul and his salvation and we see that in Acts chapter 8 I believe it is where he is saved and then he goes into the Arabian desert and he goes there for 14 years to sort it all out because he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He, he was very religious and he didn't understand. And remember, there's no scripture of the New Testament. Even the life of Jesus, the Gospels had not yet been written. And, and the book of Acts was happening. So there was no writing of it. And so you need to understand that. And, and by the way, the Apostle Paul is the one that wrote two-thirds of the New Testament so that obviously hadn't been written yet. Here's a guy that got converted and he is called into something magnificent. As a matter of fact, it says to uh, Ananias who met Paul after his conversion, it says he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name, listen to this, to the Gentiles and to kings. And he declares Paul's calling into ministry upon his salvation. He's declaring his call into ministry, but it is not yet time for Paul to be separated to ministry. He's got to sort out what all this means. So God takes him into obscurity for 14 years. And during that 14 years, he's sorting out 
Who is this Messiah? Who is this Jesus that arrested me on the road to Damascus? What is this? How does all this pertain and how is he the fulfillment of everything I've studied in the Old Covenant and the prophets and on and on and he's sorting this out and he's having encounters with God and God is literally taking him up into the third heaven and showing him things that he says later they're mysteries that I it's not even lawful for me to share with you but he comes out of the Arabian desert empowered much like Jesus came out of the wilderness empowered with the Holy Spirit and ready to move forward and he begins to do this and when he goes and he is moving forward he is first and foremost submitted to authority and they come to a prayer meeting And the Holy Spirit speaks at this prayer meeting and says, now it's time for him to be launched. Separate unto me Paul and Barnabas, this dynamic duo, for the work I have called them to. And so they launch in the book of Acts. You can read it and and you'll see it in Acts 13 and 14. They get separated into their ministry, but it's mostly a small regional anointing. I'm going somewhere with this. It's a small regional anointing, and they're they're just in a in a in a almost in a in a in a infancy stage of what will be. Yeah. See, God doesn't launch you to the nations just because He's called you to the nations. Right. He gives you an assignment. For you to, listen to me, be faithful in that. Faithfulness is God's crowbar for promotion. And the longer we are faithful and patient with God and not getting ahead of God, but just being faithful where we're planted. What has God assigned you to? Be faithful in that. And the Apostle Paul and Barnabas We're going out being faithful to the commission in the level, watch this, of anointing they had received to walk in. The anointing is the burden-removing, yoke-destroying power of God. It removes burdens. It destroys yokes of bondage and stronghold. What's that? So a small anointing means small stronghold. A small anointing means small burdens that are being lifted. A small anointing means a small ministry. And if you want a greater anointing, then you must seek the Lord, go into that, and be faithful where you're at, and the Lord will promote you and endue you with more power and more anointing for your next assignment. We're talking about strategy here. This is how God works. This is how he works in the body of Christ. This is Paul is our perfect example of it. He is faithful in this small region. They go through this entire region and they are spreading the gospel and Signs and wonders and things are happening in that region. And they come back and they give a report to the apostles and they say, God is doing amazing things. I feel like it just got dark in here. Um, it, it, God is doing amazing things. It's so wonderful. And they come back and they're celebrating it. And when they get back, God speaks to them and says, it's time to go again. It's time to go again. And, and they didn't know what to do. Paul and Barnabas didn't know what to do. So they decided they would just go back and encourage and maintain that which they had already done. Now you've got to understand, this might have been a year after they were back that it's time to go again. And when they decided they were going to go again, Barnabas says, Hey, my nephew, John Mark, he went with us on the first one. And uh, he needs to go with us again. 
And Paul said, oh, no, he ain't ready for this. Watch this. He's not ready for this. What we're about to encounter, because I feel in my spirit there's something bigger, and he's not ready for that. He's kind of a mama's boy, kind of a wimp, kind of homesick. And I, I, I just, I can't have that right now. I don't need a project. I need to go do what God's called me to do. And the Bible says the contention between Paul and Barnabas was so great over John Mark that they separated. You can be anointed and still separate from another ministry, right? And they didn't understand that that separation wasn't necessarily a, it was a conflict but it wasn't a conflict that was a negative. You see in the back side of it, it turned to a positive. Because remember, Paul has this anointing to reach the world. Barnabas' anointing was in a different capacity. And Barnabas goes, and the Bible says, he took John Mark with him, and Paul said, well, I don't have you anymore, Barnabas, so I'm going to take Silas with me. So now you've got Paul and Silas coming together, teaming up as a dynamic duo to go and fulfill what God had called Paul to do. And along their way, they met a young man by the name of Timothy. Is this okay? They meet a young man by the name of Timothy. Comes from a, from a broken home broken spiritually. His father, and this is really important, is a Greek, which means heathen. Right. Now, if you're Greek, that doesn't mean you're a heathen. <laughs> but back then it did. Because the Greeks were given to Greek mythology. Zeus and Apollos and all the Greek gods. They believed that. And Timothy had that in his inheritance, but the Bible lists his inheritance through his mama. She was a praying woman. Lois and Eunice, mama and grandma. And mama and grandma prophesied and prayed over young Timothy, and Timothy grew up fearing God and knowing God and not following the ways of his father. And Paul comes through this region and he sees this kid, Timothy, and he said, there's my protege. Yes. Something clicked in his spirit and he said, this is my guy. Yes. And he takes him along on the journey. So now it's Paul, Silas, and Timothy. And the Bible says that the writer of the book of Acts is the apostle Luke who wrote the book of Luke, but he also wrote the book of Acts. You learn anything today. And so Luke, who was a physician, goes with them, and what he's doing is documenting all that God is doing in the journey of Paul and Silas. And he's documenting it. I don't think he realizes that he's documenting it to write a book. He's just going along with them. He's part of the missionary team, if you will. So now you got Paul, you got Silas, you got Timothy, you got Luke, and then the Bible says there were others. So I don't know who others are, the Bible doesn't say, but those four were in it. And they go back and they start back in this local journey again, and they come to a point and they realize and it dawns on Paul, and he says, you know what? We don't need to continue this. I, I desired to continue and go on this journey again. I went one way. Barnabas went the other. Barnabas is going to make the rounds. I don't need to do this. And he goes, and the Bible says, Holy Spirit forbid him to continue on the path and the plan that he had. Can I just tell you, if you follow the leading of Holy Spirit, this is what this whole lesson, this whole series is 
about. What if I'm led by the Spirit? What if I'm walking in the Spirit? If you're walking in the Spirit, He will mess up your plans. He will mess you up. That's why I think there's a lot of people that are not being led by the Spirit. They're being led by a program or by a system or whatever. But watch this. God says the system is too small for what I've got for you. I've got bigger things for you. And the only way you're going to go into bigger things is to be led by my Spirit. And my Spirit will forbid you to be limited anymore. Who glory to God. And then they said, well, let's go north. And then the Bible says that the Spirit forbid them to go north. So here they are seeking the Lord and seeking Holy Spirit and saying, we want to be led by you. We want you to lead us and guide us. What do we do? We can't go where we were. We can't go where we want. What do you want? And they basically were hearing, go west, young man. And they went as far as they could to the sea. And now all they got in front of them is an ocean. They can't go back. They can't go north. And Paul's basically, now what? And he's out there one night looking over the ocean. Spirit of God takes him into a vision and unfolds his destiny in front of him with a man that's in a place called Macedonia, which is a region that, watch this, the Greeks are in charge. It's places like Corinth, Ephesus. It's places like Athens. All these places And there is a man from Macedonia that appears to him in a vision and says, come on over the ocean. Come to us. We need you. And he sees that the Spirit of God is leading him. He says, boys, we're crossing the ocean. They go across and they land in a city called Philippi. Philippi was a Greek city that was also a Roman uh, settlement. And it was large and it was significant. It was strategic in all of Macedonia. And God took them, watch this, to a strategic place to launch. Remember the book of Acts is a strategic book. And he strategically takes them for the spreading of the gospel and not just the spreading of the gospel, but the fulfillment of Paul's destiny and his calling. And they get there. And man, they get out and they're doing these wonderful things and they're ministering and they go down and they hear about some women that uh, they pray but they don't really know Jesus and, and they pray though, they're, 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 they love God but they don't know about Jesus and they go down and they join these women down at the river to pray, hallelujah. Hallelujah. And when they went down to the river to pray and they joined them, there's this one woman that rises up and says, my name is Lydia, and they lead her to Jesus. And she becomes the first convert of the Apostle Paul in this amazing journey. And they're going along and they're, they're praying with people and they're seeing people getting saved and everything is wonderful. And then the Bible says, one day, somebody say one day. They are on their way to prayer again in another prayer meeting. And when it says in Acts chapter 16, verse 16, finally get to a slide here. My time. Um, Now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain female slave possessing a spirit, a demon, which is a python spirit associated with the demonology of the pagan Greek religions. 
the Greek gods, encountered us. Who? Oh. Another word for encountered is opposed us, were in our way, and came, and she was of such a nature that she provided her masters with a profitable business by acting as a seer or an oracle and delivering prophecies and oracles. This woman, this woman, having followed after Paul and us, the rest of the team, so here's the picture. They're going around, and this woman starts following them everywhere they go. Now, they're going and doing the gospel, and she's coming along following right up behind them. And what's she doing? It says that she kept on saying these words. These men are servants of the Most High God, such as are making known to you the way of salvation. Well, that doesn't sound too bad. She's declaring to everybody, these men are of God, and they're giving you the way of salvation. That sounds good the first time, but the Bible says that over and over, day after day, she kept doing it. And look at what it says about Paul. Paul, being thoroughly annoyed and indignant, was worn out. This devil was wearing him out. And having turned around to the Spirit, he said, I charge you in the name of Jesus Christ, come out of her at once. And he came out of her, some translations say, immediately. Now, this gets me to where I wanted to be because it pertains to you and I. When there is an advancement of the gospel, there will be a resistance and a stopping where the enemy comes in and tries to stop it. And the spirit of Python was such a spirit. And this woman was possessed, demon possessed, with this spirit of Python. Now what you've got to understand is, she was the oracle of somebody. Meaning this, she was channeling the voice of someone, right, to people. And she was making people in the, in the community lots and lots of money. Yes. So who was she channeling? What is this about? Well, you got to understand that she was channeling Apollo, the Greek god who was the sun in, didn't really exist, but in Greek mythology, he is the son of Zeus the head God. And now Apollo is his right hand. And you need to understand that it is a demonic representation of God the Father and God the Son. Apollo was over in Greek mythology, he was over all the fine arts, all the music, all the dance, all the poetry, all the medicine, all the expression, and over prophecy and the telling of the future. He was the God of the sun and light and is concerned or was concerned with the health, listen to me, the health and the education of the children. And he presided over their passage into adulthood. In other words, teenagers. He was the God that gave direction for teenagers into adulthood. Not just that. He was the God that they referred to as the one with, uh, that was in charge of the founding, this important, the founding of new towns and the establish, establishment of civil constitutions or writings and was associated with dominion over the colonists. 
and he was the giver of the laws. In other words, in Greek mythology and this stronghold, it was a territorial stronghold that says, I own this region. And what Paul was coming up against was the oracle that was under the spirit of Python, which is a demonic spirit associated with Apollos, the Greek god Apollo. Do you get this? So now he's coming up against this. He doesn't know anything about Greek mythology. He doesn't understand this. He only knows this, is, this woman's full of the devil. And she's saying something that sounds good. But you need to understand what's really going on is she is establishing that principality and that spirit to say, I'm in charge, I'm allowing them to be here. They are from the, quote, Most High God, and they're coming with a way of salvation, and I'm going to be associated with them. And Paul is walking around going, oh no, the devil is a liar. And he's getting annoyed by the spirit, this python. And he is getting uh, beyond annoyed. He's getting angry about it. And he just turns around one day and he whips around and he says, come out of her. And the spirit leaves her. Yeah. Remember what I said. A bigger assignment gives you a bigger anointing. Paul had never been used this way before. God was using him with a more powerful anointing. Why? Because the anointing is the burden-removing, yoke-destroying power of God. So there was a yoke of bondage over this region that was much stronger than anything they had come against before and so now he has a greater anointing he turns around and he breaks the spirit of python off of her but remember what i said this is a principality over a region and you need to understand that the spirit of python is a spirit a demonic spirit that is a territorial spirit you can put that slide up Python is a territorial spirit sent to stop you from advancing. You say, what's this got to do with faithfulness? Everything. Everything. Because Paul is going being faithful to the call and the vision of God. And as he is going in here, he is opposed by the spirit of Python. Now, you've got to understand what Python does. Python, go ahead and put that next slide up. The symptoms of a python spirit. Go. It provides an overwhelming sense of hopelessness or squeezes the life out of you. Python, a python is not one that attacks you with their venom. A python spirit or the python snake, if you will, will come along and snuggle up to you and try to find an inroad. What it was trying to do with Paul was flattery. Right. Uh-huh. Oh, I tell you, when, when people come to me with a flattering tongue and tell me how wonderful I am and how anointed I am and how wonderful this is or how wonderful that is, and they're flattery, 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 beware of people with a, with a voice of flattery because all they're trying to do is gain insight and an inroad to you. They're tantalizing your flesh by flattery and that's exactly what this woman was doing she was coming up and saying i'm associated with them i'm going to flatter them they're of the most high god they are men sent to bring you the 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 salvation and there's trying she's trying in the spirit to flatter paul and paul ain't having it Paul ain't having it. You know why? Because he identifies what she's up to and what the spirit is behind it. 
But we are walking so much in the natural and not by the Spirit that oftentimes that flattering tongue or anything that's coming to tantalize our flesh and brag on us and say, you're so wonderful, I just think you're just... A, and boy, get to feeling good about that. Because who doesn't like a compliment? There's a very big difference between a compliment and, and stroking your ego to the point that it's just setting yep. you up yep. for an entrance. Oh, my God. And flattering, flattery will come and try to find the inroad. And if you're walking by the flesh and you go, ooh, that feels oh. good. I'm going to enjoy this. Yeah, come on with me. Python just got oh. its inroad. My God, I'm talking to somebody. Python gets the inroad. And now what he's trying to do is get you in his grip. And when he gets you in his grip, you can't get free. You are bound. And he will squeeze the breath out of you. Squeeze the life out of you. He's not going to bite you. He's going to squeeze you to where you can't breathe. Oppression and heaviness and feeling like the very life of God is coming out of you. And I can't breathe. I made an altar call last Sunday for those that were feeling that. You didn't know it, but it's the spirit of Python that I was identifying. And this altar was full of people. And I knew when the altar call was made and, pe- and it was full of people that God had led me to speak on this subject for you. This is very important to you. Because Python is trying to get his clutches around you. And he's trying to squeeze the very breath of God, the life of God. Yes. See, when you're full of the Spirit of God, there is life. There is liberty, there is freedom. Where the Spirit, come on, of the Lord is, there is freedom. That's why we have encounters, to get people free from things like Python and any other generational curses and junk that they've been carrying around that is hindering them and holding them back. You need to go to an encounter. Oh, I went two years ago, three years ago, and how's that working for you now? Because Python's got his hands on you. What Pastor Tammy said, yeah, what she said. You need to get up and go. Don't worry about having been already. (coughs) Go and get free. Python will, first of all, there's an overwhelming sense of helplessness and hopelessness. Number two, it begins to restrict your movement. When he gets his claws on you, you can't move anymore. Remember what the Bible says? They were on their way to prayer. The term on their way, oh, it's so powerful in the Greek. What it means is they were penetrating and piercing. They were advancing. I was on my way doing the call of God on my life. I was advancing, and the Spirit came and tried to stop me from advancing. And you must understand that the enemy is trying to stop you from advancing. Some of y'all think you woke up on Sunday morning with a sniffle and decided to stay home. No, that's the devil trying to keep you from advancing. Come on, somebody. Some of you come home on a Tuesday evening after work and you're exhausted and you're tired and you were on your way to prayer and you decided, I'm tired tonight, I'm not going to go. I'm just going to sit home and watch the Olympics or whatever. Nothing wrong with those things except for they are sent to stop you from advancing. There is a spirit behind it. It is a spirit of Python trying to wrap itself around you and to keep you from moving forward in any way or any kind of movement at all. You're just squeezed. You're tight. You can't move and you can't breathe. What else does the symptom of Python bring? 
Oh, it limits your influence and your impact. Because you're limited and you can't breathe, now you have no influence. You can't have any impact where God sent you. Some of you teachers are going back this week. Administrators have already gone back. And you're wondering what kind of school year it's going to be. I'll tell you what it's going to be. It's going to be whatever you call it to be. If it's going to be like last year, it's because you've been saying it's going to be like last year. Oh, here we go again. Here we go again. Oh, I'm dreading this. Oh, my God. It's so terrible. Blah, blah, blah. That's exactly what you're going to get, baby. Because the spirit of Python is around you, and it's limiting your influence and your impact. God has called you into a region to make a difference wherever you're at. My God. And when you're a teacher in the classroom, I can't talk about God. I can't pray. You can pray in the Holy Ghost under your tongue and let God give you words over these children and these, yeah. these kids. Yeah. No, listen to me. Listen to me. Yes. The spirit of Apollo, the spirit of Python was over education and the development of children going into, child, into adulthood. I know what I'm talking about. This is a regional spirit trying to stop the advancement of the gospel. And the body of Christ has to say, no more. Loose your grip. You can't stop me. I ain't saying you go into the classroom and prophesy and declare and thus saith the Lord and speak in tongues to your kids and lay hands on them and share the gospel with them and all that. No, 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 no. You go in like Paul did. And Paul came in and when he went to Athens, he went to Mars Hill. And he goes to Mars Hill and they're debating, who is God? And they said, he said, well, who's that one? They said, that's the unknown God. Can I just tell you, your kids in that classroom are looking for God in their life. And they're saying, it's in social media. It's in my sexual identity, my gender identity. Who's going to rule in my life? That's what a God is. And you can come along and you can use the wisdom by the Spirit of God of the Apostle Paul that says, Honey, it's not in that. Who's this one over here? Well, that's the unknown God. That's the one I serve. Well, tell us more. And now you say, well, meet me after class. After school, I'll be happy to tell you about this God. Come on, somebody. And you, and you enter in and you find the stronghold in that kid's life. And you begin to understand, I'm here to educate them. But part of the education is to break that spirit of Python, that spirit of Apollo over education, and to go in and to free them into God's way. I don't care what Sacramento says. The devil is a liar. That's the stronghold. Is anybody here? That's the stronghold. Wherever you go, God has sent you with life and power and authority of the Spirit. And anything that's trying to stop you is a spirit of python to take your breath. That means your voice away. Silence you. Restrict you. Hold you back. Limit you. And your influence and your impact. But Paul said, no, 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 no. Is there any more? That's it, right? Go to the next slide. Thank you. Python is defeated by faithfulness. Amen. So watch this. Paul casts that demon out. And then they get mad because their money is gone. This girl can't be an oracle anymore. 
she comes to her senses and she's like, I can't do it. Now they lost all their money. And they gather up on her. Is this okay? They gather up on, on Paul and Silas. The others in the party are not with them at this time. They gather up on Paul and Silas and they drag them out into the city street and they, the crowd is upset because they love their oracle. They love all that's happened. The businessmen are very upset because their money has been tapped into. Remember, Python is over government. What goes on in the city streets, the policies, everything. It's a territorial, <clears throat> regional spirit sent to hold a straw in their hold a stronghold what's python do it brings a stronghold over people and squeezes life out of them and she dictated what their future would be so now they go in there and they're out in the streets and they are commissioned, rip their clothes off of them. So they rip the shirts off of them. And they start beating them with rods. Well, wait a minute. The same power that they had to overcome Python is now trying to regain a hold on them by saying, I'll beat it out of you. And now, if you give up, if you give up, if you give up, I'll take charge again. Regain the stronghold. Yeah. Because the devil doesn't go quietly. Yeah. He must go, but he will not go quietly. Right. You're in warfare. Yes. And sometimes warfare looks like this. Next. Faithful to persecution. They were faithful. They went in and they weren't worried about the persecution. The persecution was the beating on their back, ripping their clothes off of them, and then launching them into the Philippian jail. And they were chained at their feet and their hands. They were chained and bound. What does Python try to do? Chain you up and bind you and keep you from moving. Are you hearing me? But they were faithful in the persecution. Here's the amazing thing. Paul and Silas were Roman citizens. This was a colony of Rome. All Paul had to say was, you can't beat me, I'm a Roman citizen. And they would have stopped. But Paul didn't use his natural ability to stop what Christ was doing. He identified and understood God sent me and he sent me here for a purpose. And if that includes a beating, I'll take it for the cause of Christ. Because I'm all about him. Glory to God. You can chain me up, but you can't shut up the gospel. Because the very next thing that they were faithful to was... Prayer and praise. They're there and they said, you stopped me when I was on my way to pray. You can't stop me now. You got me chained. What did they do? They started praying. I might be in chains, but my voice is not. I've released that spirit of Python off of me. And they begin to pray in the spirit there. They didn't even know what was holding them, but they knew the enemy was trying to stop it. And that he couldn't stop their praise. He couldn't stop their prayer, and he couldn't stop their praise. And they start praising. And as they're praising, the chains fall off, and the doors open. And long about midnight, the Bible says, suddenly, everything that had them bound, they were free because of being faithful to prayer and to praise. And then they didn't stop there. They were, they were faithful to providence. What's that mean? Tim Delina says it's bad math. And what that means is this. 
Open doors and broken chains do not equal the will of God. Often, we would look at it and say, my chains are off, the doors are open, the Lord, look what the Lord has done, and they would have left. But remember, Paul knew in the vision, I see a man calling me. I'm supposed to be here. And if it's landed me in this prison, I don't care that my chains are off. I don't care the door is open. I'm staying to the providence of God. I will stay. I won't take that open door as my sign to leave. I will stay. And they stayed. And the jailer it woke up. He has been asleep. He wakes up by the commotion. And he looks and he sees the door is open. So he assumes, the Bible says, that the, that the captives have all gone free. And he takes his sword ready to kill himself. And Paul says, we're still here. Don't do that. I don't know. Maybe Paul recognized him from his vision. I'm a man that need, I don't know. Maybe he didn't. Maybe his vision was blurred. He knew it was a man, but he didn't know and he couldn't identify. And he was standing there in the prison saying, what if this prison guard is why God sent me? And sure enough, he wins the prison guard. He wins, he wins their whole family to the Lord. Next one. So you're faithful to providence. Next one. You're faithful to preach and prophesy. The Bible says that they went to his home. This guy cleans their wounds. The same man that created the wounds is now cleaning their wounds and saying, how do I get saved? And they preach the gospel and begin to prophesy to him and his whole household. And they say, this isn't just for you, dude. This is for your whole household. And there are literally dozens that come around. And in the middle of the night, here they are all gathered in this prison guard's house. And they all get saved. Hallelujah. And then Paul says, take us back. And they go back to the jail. And the next morning, morning is about to break, and they come in and they say, supernaturally, let them go. Just let them go. Let them leave. And do it quietly. Spirit of Python still at work. And Paul looks and he says, oh, no. You beat me publicly. I am a Roman citizen. Why didn't you say so? We didn't ever beat you. I'm a Roman citizen. Now he uses that strategically. And he says, so you are going to come and apologize to me for beating me. And you are going to take me out into the city streets and announced that this was wrong. And they escorted him out to the city street where they had beat him and announced, we did this the wrong way. Now leave. He said, I'll leave when I'm good and ready. And he goes back to Lydia's home and he strengthens the church. And the church at Philippi was planted. And because the church at Philippi was planted, now he's leaving, but he's not Re- di- digressing he's moving forward he goes to Thessalonica he goes to Athens he goes to Corinth he goes to Ephesus and he builds churches all over the region and fulfills the destiny of God and because he goes forward we have eight books of the Bible eight of them because not only were there the six but then remember he took Timothy strategically Because now he becomes the pastor of the church of Ephesus, the largest church in the world. This young kid that was a protege is faithful. And because he watched this faithfulness and he saw how God works, now God promotes him. And he is now the pastor over the largest church in the world. And we have the books of 1st and 2nd Timothy, number 7 and number 8. All this was done because of one thing, faithfulness. 
Paul said, I was faithful in this. I was faithful in persecution. I was faithful in prayer and praise. I was faithful in providence. I was faithful to preach and to prophesy. I was faithful to the destiny of God, what God had for me. And it revolutionized everywhere I went. I'm asking you today, if you have that spirit of python that's been trying to hinder you, here's the answer. Stay faithful. Faithful to what? Faithful to whatever you're going through and just go through it for the cause of Christ. Faithful to prayer and to praise. Faithful. 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 Faithful to stay when it's not convenient to stay. Faithful. You planted me here for a purpose. I'm not quitting. I'm not leaving. Faithful. People say, how in the world did you do this in the city of Dinuba? And I say, I didn't. I was just faithful. I just wouldn't quit. The enemy tried to get me to quit, but I wouldn't quit. And if you don't quit, you win. Because that's called faithfulness. And faithfulness is God's crowbar to promote you and to move you in. We cut and run far too easy. And when it's convenient and when it's uncomfortable, whatever we're going through, don't you dare cut and run. You stand faithful and let it be God that promotes you. And God that moves you. Come on, somebody. Did you get anything out of this today? Stand to your feet. I know it's 12.05. That's not my fault. I didn't get the pulpit till 11.15. I didn't preach long. But here we are. God's good. I want to invite you this morning, if there's anybody here that you don't know Christ, I want to invite you to make a decision to say yes to him. You didn't stumble into this place. You're here by divine appointment. God sees you. God knows you. And he is extending the greatest love and invitation to you that you'll